morning, everybody. This is George C. Romero, and you're listening to the Movie Raid. It's time for the Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is George C. Romero of Romero Pictures. Hello. Hey, buddy. What's going on, man? Well, what have we been doing so far? I know you got your show. You've been kicking around for a while. What's up with that? The Indie Brigade is awesome. It's been on his show, I guess, about a year and a half prior. You know, I'm not really uh, one of these sort of fan show type guys because I spend more time banging my head against the wall as, a, as an indie filmmaker and, and as an artist than, than a fan, even though I'm a fan first. Because if you, I mean, you can't do this if you're not a fan. So anyway, so we started talking and we came up with the concept for the Indie Brigade and we turned it into this show that it's designed to be a home. It's not designed to just be a podcast. It's, it's not designed to be the same questions that you hear on other shows. It's designed to be a place for filmmakers to call home. It's designed to be a collaborative space. It's designed to be a place where we can put something out there on a weekly basis that hopefully teaches at least one filmmaker something, you know, I mean, I've been, I've been at this most of my life, definitely all of my adult life, most of my young adult life, and I've learned more through failure and struggle than I've learned through success, even though I've had both, obviously, and, and I'm grateful for anything that's ever gone right, and I'm also grateful for anything that went wrong, because it taught me, and if that's knowledge that I can push out, if that's knowledge I can pass on and give to somebody else who may be struggling, if I can help a filmmaker out of their darkness with anything that I've learned in my life or through my experiences. That's what the Indie Brigade is about, and it became this moving beast, if you will. It's crazy. It took off pretty quickly. People seem to respond well to it. We're growing exponentially almost daily. We've ended up adding several shows underneath the Indie Brigade banner. We've got, you know, the Wagner Wiles, which is a beautiful show about, you know, with Lance and Samantha Wagner. They basically come at fandom as a married couple, you know, I mean, how many, how many people who are, who are couples and one of them is a diehard fan and the other one maybe isn't, or, you know, you know, one's a diehard fan of something and the other's a diehard fan of something else. It's a great show that talks about basically the, the struggles of, of couplehood and, and how fandom can actually help solidify that and strengthen it. It's beautiful, it's beautiful people and beautiful souls and their energy is infectious. We've got a nasty nation with Chuck Daniels who's from a band called the Bastard Sons of a Judas Goat. He takes a look at sort of the super dark underground doom side of fandom and indie music and indie film and horror and things like that. And it's a phenomenal listen if anybody hasn't listened to it yet. We've got the Drone Cav, which I'm super excited about with Terry Carroll. And Terry is one of the top rated FAA experts on drones in this part of the country. And he basically makes all of his knowledge completely available for free, does weekly uploads, of video episodes where he teaches people how to not only look at drones, but how to think about which drone to get, how to learn to fly one, how to get it certified, how to get all your paperwork in order, how to use it on an indie film, and how to do things like use a drone instead of a Fisher Dolly, use a drone instead of a Super Techno Crane, things that can save filmmakers money and up their production value of their project. We've got a phenomenal blog called The Devil's in Details that's written by Ian Steyer, who's the artist behind all of the new look and feel of all of the new branding for Romero Pictures in the Indie Brigade and he's a phenomenal, phenomenal artist and he goes and talks about the creative process and, and the inner creative as a beast that's inside all of us and he puts himself and his creative out there in ways that are so in line with me personally and what I believe to be a lot of the struggles that a lot of artists face that if anybody hasn't read that they need to because I promise it'll speak to them. You know? And then we've got the, the flagship show which is the Romero Pictures Indie Brigade which is on every Friday night. That's me and Joe Ridley and, uh, and I get on there and talk about things that will hopefully pass knowledge on to some of these young young filmmakers and you know we've got some phenomenal guests that come on like a good friend of mine named Michael Mandeville who's a tremendous producer and a line producer and he's forgotten more about a bunch of things than most indie filmmakers will ever learn so he comes on and we talk about ways for people to think about how to spend money and how to raise money we talk about the hard topics the things that are knowledge that is not generally easily acquired for indie filmmakers who don't have access to a lot of resources we're trying to put it out there as much as possible so that people can really hopefully learn something and and take something good and positive away from it we're also starting up our own distribution label we're focusing on avod platforms right now but we are starting to figure out ways to put indie films into the world using avod platforms in a way that's actually for once not going to screw over the filmmaker one way or another and then beyond all of that stuff we do have paid services we've got script services we've got mentor services if you learn something from an episode or one of the shows you're welcome to go book some time with one of our mentors you know we book in two hour blocks so you get two hours one on one time with a seasoned uh, professional in the industry to talk about your project or to talk about 
about anything like that that you might need help with. I'm really trying to turn it into a resource. We're getting ready to launch a full document center that will give filmmakers not only every document that they will need to sort of approach the production of their film, but also instruction on how to use it. You know, I'm really trying to turn this into kind of absolute resource for the indie. Do you think that in part of the cause and effect in the indie film community are partly damaging within while others are actually with with good intentions, they use the uh, the victim as a card in terms of uh, as an excuse. Do you think uh, it's like a two sided thing? Like one half is doing this and the other half is doing that in, in terms of uh, making more problems to get their work out there. I think that's a loaded question, and the answer is a slippery slope. So I think the best way that I can answer that is to say that there's negativity and positivity in every industry, and when you're dealing with the arts and when you're dealing with creatives and you're dealing with artists as people, we all have a tendency to kind of like rip open our bodies and expose the rawest of nerve that we have. I mean, the idea of creating anything, writing anything, shooting anything, all of that is stuff is essentially taking the rawest nerve that a creative person has and exposing it to the world. And then saying, not only here it is, but especially in the world of the internet, saying, judging me based on this raw nerve, which is basically like saying, it would, it would feel like exposing a distal portion of your spine and then asking random strangers to poke it with a stick. I think there's enough of that stuff going on that it's easy for people to kind of get a little taken up in some of the drama that obviously comes with like whenever you make a movie there's drama it happens but when that drama gets loud and it gets broadcasted around that's when you have issues and that's when problems arise and that's when stuff comes up when i was coming up in the indie world it was collaborative it was embracing and yes it was hard and it's still fucking hard but you had to earn your bones man and once you earned your bones it was a community that would take you in and teach you and help you through the tough times and i do believe that a lot of that is gone these days because people seem to think it's better to just kind of hate on each other for their own benefit instead of realizing that if people would just work together and collaborate and help lift each other up, the community as a whole would improve, which would then by default improve the quality of projects that a lot of people are putting out. Because if you can't put yourself completely into your own work, it'll never be what you want to do as an artist, right? Making these projects, do you think they play it too safe to use an existing concept for story because of the lack of funding or lack of uh, any other visions that they, they can't receive due to, to struggling? With little responsibility. That's a really interesting question. No, I don't know that they play it safe. I think there's an inherent need for indie filmmakers to feel like they're not playing it safe. And I think that that pushes people to kind of maybe make decisions that go against that, that make it seem like they're almost playing it too safe, even though that might not be the best move for them. Sustainability, is it too hard to achieve in indie filmmaking? Do you think the the filmmakers are in companies, they sought to go for you know, something else using a fraction of the property to get the the film out there like uh, to utilize it uh in a different extent and like only using part of it to an extent and not actually use full potential to get the product out there for them capitalizing on like maybe the gore of the film when maybe that's not the whole point of the movie yes yeah, either in parts of that or not even considering the full extent of the vision that they are perceiving to the company or companies people want to represent their projects the best way they can and they want to maximize the reach of their film a lot of times and especially nowadays more often than not that's quantified by how much money a movie makes it didn't necessarily always be used to be quantified by dollars generated i don't think it's necessarily a bad thing right so if you make a movie about a power tool killer right like a guy who kills people like in a wood shop do i think there's anything wrong with cannibalizing portions of that film to go out to niches? No, I don't think so. Like, I would market the power tool aspect of it to woodworkers all over the world because that's just smart marketing. I think the more creative filmmakers can get with how to market their own films nowadays, I think is almost a prerequisite because we're in a world where the internet has taken over so much that it's almost impossible to rise to the top or even get seen if you can't figure out how to get seen in niches that are responsive. I'm not going to go market a film about niches making quilts to woodworkers. But like I said, if I had a horror film about power tool killer or whatever, I'm going to go out and I'm going to market that film to people who buy DeWalt tools and Delta table saws and grizzly jointers and all this other stuff. I don't think there's anything wrong with utilizing a portion of your film to maximize your reach. I think it's a fine line because it's easy to misidentify your project. And I think if you, as the creator and as the filmmaker, you've got to make sure that your overall message, the message that you want to be heard, is what's getting pushed out there. How the hell you do 
that, man. It's like the Wild West. Whatever you got to do to get it out there, you got to do to get it out there. Do you think sometimes they're over-monopolizing their time because they're focusing on just on one portion to get the film out there in some aspect? Absolutely. We extend ourselves. We're, we spread ourselves way too thin. We always have. There's been movies that I've made where I was pretty much most of the crew. You know what I mean? Like, there was movies I made where I ran sound and camera and directed my actors and did all of that stuff and developed the props and did stuff like that. It's what you do as an independent filmmaker. But I do believe that that arena has grown so much that spreading ourselves thin has taken on an entirely new meaning because we live in a world where most people get stuff done behind the keyboard more than they get stuff done by going out and mingling or going out to a function. We get people with their campaigns and their social campaigns and all that stuff and it's tricky because as the artist you're making something that you want you hope is going to touch people's lives and that you want to get out there into the world but then you end up spending most of your time behind a keyboard trying to reach people on social media and again there's a fine line and a balance anybody listening to this pays attention to any of my socials you'll you'll all notice that there'll be entire weeks where I'll just kind of disappear that's because I'm out doing me I'm out living my life I'm out having experiences that make me a better filmmaker I'm out having experiences that introduce me to people in the industry and outside the industry fans business folks I mean the whole thing investors you have to find a balance you can't live your life behind a keyboard because you will ultimately spread yourself so thin and have nothing to show for other than likes, comments, clicks, that kind of stuff. So that there's a way to reach and, and get the attention of a lot of these companies. You just have to be smart about it and, and, and know your own boundaries and go out and, and try to do the best you can. Despite of technology, despite of everything around it, despite on on this new technology and stuff, it's not it's not really exactly one hundred percent helping everybody. It's just sometimes it's actually hurting you. Yeah, it actually does. It does. I agree with you completely. It, it's it's kind of sad in its own way, but it's 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 kind of like the life that unfortunately society has kind of ran its course. At least the current trend of things, at least for a while now. But unfortunately, that when these film artists are still using what we consider now primitive things, but those those sometimes the simplest thing is really the best thing and how you perceive it and how you form it and how you structure it it can be one amazing piece and especially if it's a low cost it can be phenomenal to everybody else because it's that one simple thing that we've been using for decades that's right and and you know i mean here's the thing like with all the technology that's available out there nowadays older tech or using any of that other sort of stuff you're talking about it becomes a choice because with everything that's available to young filmmakers these days so much more can be achieved and, and production value can go through the roof. It can skyrocket. Films can be better. Quality can be better. Audio can be better. Color can be better. Editing can be better. But if you so choose to use something, then as long as it's used properly and it's motivated, I'm not going to try to make a, a CGI spy thriller using a VHS camcorder from 1987. But if I'm making a film that takes place in 1987 and I want my viewers to be trapped inside the bubble of 1987, then I am acting absolutely going to use tech from that time period. I did a piece from the 50s, or uh, set in the 50s once, and uh, there was nothing on the set that was newer, uh, other than lighting, there was nothing newer than the 50s. I mean, our camera was from the 40s, our lenses were from, like, 1956, and we used the same process that they used in, in the time period to make the film. And, I mean, some people may say that's overkill or weird or whatever, but there's an authenticity that comes with it that cannot be denied. The thing about it, and just to touch on this a little bit further, hopefully this will resonate with some folks, is that the reason that movies look the way they look, and I say this a lot, and sometimes it falls on deaf ears, but sometimes people get it. The reason movies, big movies, look the way they look today is because it has always been a very tiny community of the same folks who have done the big movies that go out in theaters, and so what that means is that audiences, whether they realize it or not, have been trained. So in other words, the way that they shot handheld camera footage in the 30s or in the 40s it was done a certain way because cameras were heavy and lights were heavy. And so for a handheld camera shot in 1947 to be achieved, you have this massive film camera with your operator and your focus puller and your camera support team. And you'd see these groups of like six people all huddled around the camera moving like a unit, all moving this thing with their hands on the camera or their hands on the operator, making sure everything stayed stable. Nowadays, people grab a phone and they just whip their arms around and keep everything in frame. It's a lot different. It's a lot different than, than it was back in the day. But if you watch these big movies, if you watch these big, huge cinema films and these big blockbusters and stuff that still use the big, big they're granted their digital cameras, but they're still these massive rigs. Uh, the handheld stuff is often done the same way. There's multiple people with hands on the camera. 
audiences don't realize and what a lot of fans don't realize is that over the years, we've all been trained subconsciously to understand what a handheld camera shot looks like. What that means is our eyes and our minds have associated handheld camera shots in movies that we've seen, uh, like Raiders of the Lost Ark and Star Wars and all that stuff. We associate that subconsciously with what a handheld camera shot should look like. So now when you get people out there running around and not, you know, basically with their hand right on the sensor of the camera and moving around and following somebody with a handheld shot, it looks erratic. Many people, you know, who say, oh man, I tried to watch that, but it made me feel car sick. Well, that's why, because even if you're using a DSLR, build a cage around it. Make your camera weigh 30 pounds. Move your entire body. Don't just move your arms. Don't just move your hands. Don't just jerk the camera around. You know, learn the ways that it was done forever. Learn the ways that the giants who came before us did things so that if you're going to stand on their shoulders, you at least stand on their shoulders with respect and build on what they've done, as opposed to saying, I'm going to do it my way, because it's not always going to work out in your favor. Now, that's, again, not to say that there's not room for innovation and there's not room for change when it comes to these things, but you have to think about your audience when you're a film. Like you're making a movie for yourself and for your creative, and you have to get it out there, but you have to think about, ultimately, the people who are going to watch it, because you want to make it for them. You want them to see what you put into it. If you do if you do a film and it's an homage to Orson Welles, you want people who watch it to say, yeah, I get why he called it an homage to Orson Welles. You don't want people to go, oh, it's an homage to Orson Welles because he turned it into a black and white movie with it, right? You, know, you want people to recognize framing. You want people to recognize lighting. You want people to recognize that you know what you're doing. You want your message to get across. You're not going to do that if you're immune to the ways of the pathfinders who figured this shit out in the first place. Go ahead and plug in any websites or anything that we can check out right now. Oh man, the best website to go to is my company website, RomeroPictures.com. It has links to everything. It has links to all of the Indie Brigade content. It has links to all of our YouTube content. It has links to all of our projects. We're even starting to put some production diaries up there. So as films are getting done and films are getting made along the way and, and the investor meetings are happening and distribution meetings are happening for certain individual projects, we're starting a production diary portion of the Indie Brigade where people can come and, and watch along with us and, and be in the struggle with us and understand that it's not just them who go through the bullshit. We all go through the bullshit. It's just a question of how you navigate. So RomeroPictures.com is the best place to find links to everything. We're on Facebook, Indie Brigade, Romero Pictures, Indie Brigade. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're across all the socials. We're everywhere, man, and we're, we're, we're going to get bigger and we're going to be even more places. So you're not going to be able to go to get a coffee without realizing the Indie Brigade is somewhere to have your back. That's excellent, man. And there you have it, everybody. That is George C. Romero.